know, you're going to know what I'm talking about. There was a joke on the Fraser show between brothers Niles and Fraser. They were um, somebody had invited them to a party, and the host of the party says, "Well, if you get the one, then you get the other." And they weren't really sure which was was the one and which one was the other. I feel confident in telling you this morning, standing up here, I am the other Reese. The, <laughs> The original Reese is at a convention in San Diego, so I am the other one today. If you are able, will you please stand and welcome. Welcome to each other. Welcome to those of online with us. First one. Church. And I want to welcome all of our worshipers online and I encourage you to connect with Karen Harris. She is our online host. If you have any questions, she will be happy to answer them for you. Let us know you're worshiping with us so that we can connect with you later on in the week. And if you miss a Sunday morning worship service, have no fear. You can find us on YouTube, which is a great place to also connect and find us if you're ever just needing a pick-me-up during the middle of the week. Go to our YouTube channel, find one of our services, listen to our great uh, music department, sing to your soul, and just find a moment of renewal. So just know that anytime you need to dial in and touch the pulse of God just through worship, you can connect with your church, and it'll help you connect with God. Okay, a couple of announcements this morning. Tomorrow night is our Thanksgiving community dinner supper. And I am thrilled that we're back inside for this Thanksgiving dinner this year. So it's going to take lots of hands on deck. If you are interested in coming and helping us serve, we would love to have you. So we're going to need people willing to serve. We've got, um, uh, we're going to need people willing to stay and help us clean up. We're going to be helping sign people up for more mission post boxes and help connect them to services and community that they need. Hand out drinks, hand out pie. Speaking of pie, Thanksgiving community dinner is known for pie. So if you would like to make a pie or bring a pie, we encourage you to do that. Our only recommendation is that please have it already baked. So our ovens are usually overwhelmed on Thanksgiving community dinner, so we don't have time to bake them. So if you will bake your pie and drop it off tomorrow, anytime during the day, we would love to cut it up and give it out to our friends. And depending on how many pies we have and how many friends we have, it depends on the size of the pie. So we are excited. So think about it. There's pumpkin, there's pecan, there's all kinds of stuff at the store, but come be a part of that Come help us serve. We start to serve at 5.30. If you want to join us uh, to help us prep, be here around 5 or as soon as you can. Um, And we look forward to having you. So we have a lot of upcoming things coming as Advent is coming. Can you believe there's only one more Sunday before Advent? One more, Sharon. Just one. And I can't wait. So our first Advent Sunday is the 28th of November. So on Advent, as we kick that off, our theme this year is the gift of the nutcracker. So as you can imagine, there will be a lot of um, sugar plum fairies and dancing and dazzling gifts coming through for us uh, this particular Advent. December 1st is Hanging of the Greens. That's a Wednesday night. It's a special service where we decorate our church and we have blessings over the Christmas tree and the Christmas and 
we teach about the poinsettia and the Christian connection with that. And so it's a very beautiful service, and it really helps prepare you for the season. I encourage you to come. Our youth group will be leading that service along with our worship team. So come and support them. It takes a lot of courage for teenagers to just engage with their faith. It takes even more courage for them to step out in front of their church, in front of all of you, and follow God in leading you in preparing for Advent. So show up and support them. Show them that their faith journey matters and encourage them in their worship leadership. And then on Sunday, December 5th, we're going to have a soup supper for uh, those of us in the body of Christ. Just bring a friend, bring a soup, and we're going to eat together, fellowship together, and play bingo. So we're going to have some really fun prizes. If you or someone you know has prizes that they things that they'd like to donate to be prizes, let me know. Contact me. We'd love to include those. <sighs> okay, and then the Christmas pageant for kids and youth is coming up. On the exact same day, we're going to have our ring and sing. So that is December 19th. Don't miss that service. It's going to be amazing. If you didn't see our post on Facebook this week, our chancel ringers are back. We are so excited. The first time in 20 months, right? First time in 20 months to have all of them together again, and they were rehearsing upstairs in their bell room, and we just rejoice to have them back. So know that you will be seeing them during Advent. We can't wait. So don't, you just never know what surprises you get on a Sunday morning, so don't miss. Okay, all right. Two things, two last minute things you'll find in your bulletins. Your pledge cards for this year, they'll also be mailed out to your house. I'll talk about those in a little bit, but hold on to those. Um, for there's a, We have a special gift for everyone who turns in a pledge card this year. So if you turn one in, you get a special gift, which I'm sure is worth not very much, but a whole lot of love from your pastor. And, uh, and then our Advent devotionals, which is a gift from your church to you, thanks to your giving. Um, part of what we do is we buy Advent devotionals for everyone who would want one. These will begin to be available next Sunday. So if you would like one mailed to you, please comment there in the comment section. Um, and if we don't have your mailing address, send us a private message. For those of you here in church, just call the church or um, let me know and I'll make sure you get one of these. All right. That's a lot of announcements. I just had to take a moment there to breathe. Okay. Let's remind ourselves what our mission and purpose is as a church as we come to worship. What is it that God's calling us to do and be together? If you feel your bulletin, at St. Paul's United Methodist Church, we are a community of Christ followers who serve, worship, and grow together from the heart of downtown Shawnee. At St. Paul's United Methodist Church, we believe we are called to the mission of making disciples by connecting, serving, and sharing in the love of Christ to all of God's children for the transformation of the world. Let us pray. Oh, God, you are so good to us. You are so faithful to us. Even in times when we feel surrounded by darkness, you remind us that you are still present, even if we feel we cannot see you. Whether we are on the mountaintops or the mountains are in our way, Lord, you remind us you are there with us and we are not alone. You've called us from slumber in different places around the country to be here together right now, to be reminded as a community that this journey is a holy one, a powerful one, filled with grace and love and promise. Almighty God, move in this place, and may all of your children hear your voice. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able in your hymnals, page 98. I love a good opening hymn. This is a good Fanny Crosby, good opening hymn. Sing out for me, please. Click on the link in the bulletin if you're online and sing with us.
and a half years ago, I arrived here and I asked the church a question. Every person I met, I asked a question. And it was this, if St. Paul's ceased to exist in Shawnee, would your community know it? And I ask you today, four and a half years later, if you suddenly ceased to exist, would Shawnee know it? Okay. Okay. That's why we give. It's why we show up. It's why we do the work that we do. Because we impact the lives that are here, the lives that are online, the lives that are in our streets. Are we doing God's work? If yes, let's keep it going. If we are serving God's people, are we clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, visiting the imprisoned, being with those who are lost and alone, tending to the widows and widowers? Are we doing God's work? Are we building up a place where children and youth can come before the throne of God? If the answer is yes, then that's a church worth supporting faithfully. Because it's not my work or your work, it's God's work. And God is all around us. That's why we give on Sunday mornings. Not to fill any buckets or coffers or buy your pastor a jet. That's just not ever going to happen. I'm giving up on that. I don't just... But so that we can actually change lives and be the gospel message to Jesus Christ of all that we are and all whom we serve. If this is something you can get behind, I encourage you to prayerfully consider how you can support the work and the ministries of our congregation in the year to come. Let us pray over our gifts today. Lord of life and love, we offer these gifts to you Bless them and use them that others might be encouraged in the faith. Gracious God, use our lives as well. Help us share your story and pour out your love on everyone we meet. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. When number one, you're supposed to have it all together. And when they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them, never better. Line number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. The truth be told. The truth is rarely told. No. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, no, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. There's a sign on the door, it says come as you are, but I doubt it. Cause if we live like that were true, every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. Didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A 
a safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred and the prodigal like me. The truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Oh, oh am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine. No, oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told, can I really stand here unashamed? Knowing that your love for me won't change Oh God, if that's really true Then let the truth be told I say I'm fine, yeah I'm fine Oh I'm fine, hey I'm fine But I'm not I'm broken And when it's out of control I say it's under control But it's not And you know it I don't know why it's so hard to admit it When being honest is the only way to fix it There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know Yeah, I know There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know So let the truth be told help today because I wondered if you know any good knock knock jokes. You do? I, I kind of thought you might. Tell me. Knock knock. Who's there? Oh. Okay. Who's got another knock knock joke? Who's there? Cow. Cow who? Who? <laughs> Ooh, I love it. I love it. That made you think of one, too. I got one. Knock, knock. There? Goat. Go to the door and find out. <laughs> no? Okay. No. Do you know any knock, knock jokes? Okay, I'll tell you what. If you got one, pastor's got a knock, knock joke. Well, I mean, if you got one for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of knew this might happen. So why don't you stand up here and cause your trouble? Okay. This is, this is how... Um, your pastor throws me off every time I try to tell a knock-knock joke. Ready? Knock-knock. Come in. <laughs> what are you supposed to say to that? <laughs> no, hold on, let's try again. Knock-knock. Come in. <laughs> okay, you can go sit back down. You're fine. <laughs> can you believe that? Isn't that troublesome? And, but the truth is... God is kind of like that, too. Sometimes we say knock-knock on heaven's door. Who's there? Knock-knock, <laughs> knocking on heaven's door. So, um, yeah, where are you at? I was waiting for that. Saber and Jamie, that was for you. Uh, sometimes God, we go up to God and we're like, knock-knock, knock-knock, and God's like, come in. And we're like, don't you want to say who's there? Or don't you want to say, did you do this? Did you do that? And God's just like, no, come in. Come in. God doesn't have all those restrictions of, of the things that we would have. But at the same time, what you, you, you thought of a knock-knock joke? Go for it. Knock-knock. Who's there? Pig. Pig who? Big pig. Big pig? Okay. <laughs> Oink. <laughs> you know who else stands outside the door and knocks? Jesus does. Yeah. In fact, look here. Look at our stained glass. It's not just, hey, you guys. He's actually knocking on a door. He stands on the door and he knocks. And we say, who's there? And he says, it's your eternal life. It's your salvation. It's your love for others. It's your peace and it's your courage. 
knock, knock, who's there? It's me, I'm standing. Will you open the door for Jesus to come into your life so that when you go knocking on God's door, God causes all the good trouble that Pastor Tiffany does and just says, come in, come in, because Jesus is already in with you. And God says, because you're with my son, Jesus, you can come in. Let's pray. Father, thank you for knocking on our door, even when we're not sure we want company. Thank you for coming in and loving us, even when we feel unlovable. Help us to see that your Father God has the door wide open waiting for us to come in. Help us to share that news with others so we can bring them in with us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Oh, wait. One more. Knock, knock. Who? Knock, knock. If you will stand, if you're able, we are going to do another Fanny Crosby hymn. It, but the number in the bulletin is wrong. It is actually hymn number 407, close to the... Okay, we're going to be reading from Matthew 7, 7 through 12, and then 24 through 29. Ask, and it will be given, given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. For everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you? Who, if your child asks for bread, you would give them stone? Or if your child asks for a fish, you would give them a snake? If then, who are evil, know how to give God's gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and act on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it's been on, founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be foolish, will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. The great and great was all. I'm sorry, let's try this again. <laughs> and then great it was fell. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds 
for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of God for the people of God. May the words of my mouth not be of my own, but may they be yours. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There's an old saying that goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Are you familiar with that one? Even more than good intentions, the road to complacency avenue is paved with apathy and pride. Complacency, so defines the dictionary, is a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often while unaware of some potential danger, defect, or like self-satisfaction or smug satisfaction with an existing situation. Now, contentment is a bit different. Contentment is the state of ease of mind. We like to think of that as peace. It does not present with smugness, lack of awareness, nor is it rooted in the self, right? Jesus tells us, I'm going to give you a peace that only I can give. We seek our own peace and it often falls short. Christian complacency is built on a foundation of checklists. Maybe these seem a little familiar to you. I musts, I shoulds, and I oughts, all of which miss the point. Christ didn't come for us to build more oppressive systems, but to set prisoners, us, free from the broken systems we already have and live in, and instead to give us a new way of doing things, a way that is contrary to the way of the world. The road to complacency leads us away from God. What God desires the most is connection with us, with you in particular. Let's not be foolish, right? The scripture tells us over and over again, but let's be wise. While we can sustain a level of connectedness to God without others, it's just not the same. And if COVID taught us anything, it's that. We can still be family, but it's not the same over Zoom, right? Didn't feel right. We can still celebrate Christmas, Jesus is still born, but it's not the same over Zoom, yeah? We can have friends and we can play bingo nights and we can do all kinds of things online and we give great glory to God for giving us that invention some days. But it's not the same. You know, we can take college classes online, but you're not going to get the same out of it that you will being present in class with a professor in front of you and students and classmates around you. We can worship online and we give God thanks for that ability, but there's something different about being able to see the faces of those we're worshiping with. But we think we can do it all alone. It's part of our great pride. I got this and I can do it myself. Well, maybe that's just me. We were not built or made to be alone all of the time. So God keeps calling us back to read the scriptures, to hymns and music, to small groups and fellowship, to worship and service and prayer and connection. God keeps calling us back to the body. And the Holy Spirit, being the advocate that it is, keeps nudging us. Don't you think? Don't you think you should maybe reconnect? Don't, don't, don't you think maybe it's time? It's, it's time to, to get back into the swing of things or find the things that give you passion, make you feel alive and most connected to God. Is it time? When we convince ourselves we can't go it alone, or when we convince ourselves we can go it alone, we are failing to acknowledge how we've never actually gone alone. We've never actually been alone or had to do it on our own, ever. When we choose not to do some daily brushing of the decay that sticks to our soul, we walk around with nasty, wet, woolen socks, keep telling ourselves it's fine. If God really wants these socks off my teeth, God will brush them himself. 
but we think of things that way spiritually. So it just gets hard. So it's easier to walk away. It's easier to quit. It's just easier to quit. Because you know, if we quit, we don't let anybody down. If we quit, nobody can be upset at us. I grew up in a house with Kenny G playing all the time. It explains a lot about maybe what's wrong with me. Of the way the saxophone looks, I love to play it. I love to play the keys and to feel them moving and to recognize my fingers are doing their own thing and I'm not telling my brain, I'm just full of hot air and I'm putting it through an appropriate instrument. It's pretty great. I love it. I love to make music. And making music on my own is great, but making music in a band, man, there's something totally different about that. It's energizing. But you know, I wasn't going to get very far in playing the saxophone if I watched it and listened to others play it. If I stared at it in my room and just thought, what is it called, osmosis? If I stare at my saxophone long enough, I will be the next Kenny G. Sometimes I think if we just stare at our Bibles long enough, we're going to turn into Jesus. We might actually have to open that thing. I couldn't wear I love music t-shirts and suddenly be believed that I was actually a musician. Somebody asked me once, hey, how are you doing on that book? And I said, well, a lot better. I'd be a really great writer if I took the time to sit down and write. You know? What is stopping us? The practice, the nitty gritty, the discipline, the getting up early, the putting ourselves to the work. I had to engage with the saxophone. I had to put the, the thing over my neck and I had to strap in and I had to warm up the reed and the whole instrument. I had to warm it up. I had to practice. I had to fumble around. And Sharon knows what I'm talking about because she's a woodwind player too. I had to squeak. Oh, you had to squeak. You know, it just happens when you're practicing. And which, by the way, if you ever go to a concert and the woodwind squeaks, don't go, oh, we already know. We already know. I had to miss notes. Aerosmith, don't judge me, is one of my favorite bands. And they said in one of their songs, you've got to lose to know how to win. You've got to miss some notes to recognize that didn't sound right. Now I can correct and, ser and search for the right one. Why am I not hitting the right note? I had lessons. I had classes, fellow musicians, band instructors, tutors, and years of not giving up. Years of not giving up. I built confidence and muscle memory, and it just took me believing that I could. I had to believe I could. If I started off believing I was going to fail, I'd never pick that thing back up. If I started off believing I would be the worst in the band, I'd have no motivation to show up. If I looked at it and said, I'll never be any good, why would I try? If I gave up every time I squeaked in a concert, I'd never play another concert. It was about years of not giving up. Have you heard the phrase, you reap what you sow? Anybody ever hear that phrase? Okay. In our house, you'll hear that if you play a mean card in a previous hand of hearts, and now you just took the queen, everybody at the table will be like, mm -hmm, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. In scripture, it means you will harvest whatever you choose to plant and nurture. So I'm going to ask you, in your life, what are you planting? What seeds are you planting? Will it serve you on the mountaintops? What you put your time, your energy, your practice, your heart to, will that serve you at your greatest moments? Will it serve you when the mountains are not something you're on top of, but there's something that's in your way? something that you need God to move. Will what you're planning today help you? What are you preparing your soil or your soul for? Because you reap or harvest what you plant. What you put in, Jesus says, comes out. Our words are a reflection of what's in our hearts. So yeah, when I see mean, unkind, and hateful speaking people, I pray for them right away because the heart is not okay. There's some weeds 
in the field. We get angry at God when we plant apathy and complacency and we don't reap a bountiful life. Well, God's just not for me. Yeah, but did we plant seeds of faith, of hope, of gratitude, of discipline and devotion and practice? So C.S. Lewis in the first 16 letters of the screw tape letters shows us how the world and temptation calls us away from God. His themes include the church. So think of it. These are all the ways that temptation wants us to turn away from God. They're going to attack our church. They're going to attack your family. They're going to attack you through prayer. It's going to attack you through wars personally and globally. They will attack you through patriots and pacifists, through dry and desert experiences, through life phases. They will attack you in your clique. They'll attack you through humor. They'll attack you through sloth. That's where we get those socks on our teeth. It'll attack you through pain and pleasure, through humility. Superman don't need no seatbelt. But the good Lord did give us wisdom and common sense, though it seems not very common sometimes. Scholar Dr. Jerry Root writes, Each of us is intolerant of pride when we see it in others, but false humility is manifest in our blindness to pride in our own lives every time it raises its head in us. It's easy to read the screw tape letters and criticize the patient or the human. It seems... The the tools of screw tape and wormwood, the demons, are so obvious. You know, we sit there, it's like watching a modern horror film, and they run in, and here's the bad guy, and she goes up the stairs, and all of us just go, oh, why did you go up the stairs or down into the basement? Get outside. It's so easy to watch someone else's story and say, oh, yeah, you should have seen that coming. Not so easy in our own lives. We don't examine our own souls. We engage in correcting others, fixing their lives, highlighting their flaws. But the Christian is called to internal, eternal work, personal holiness. In the words of Dolly Parton, stay out of my closet if your own is full of trash. In other words, take care of your trash, don't mind mine. Work on cleaning your own closet. Personal tilling, planting, nurturing, and harvesting, they make our witness and our work more impactful for others, not to others. If we look at it as we're doing the work to others, it's all about what we're doing. If we do it for them, it's all about what they get out of it. We don't do the work, grow in grace, live and serve in community, be in close relationship with God so that others can remark how marvelous we are because they know we're not because at the end of the day, we're human. We work on personal holiness for others. The more we tend our soil and soul, the greater we are able to live in social holiness. The less this whole thing becomes about what you think of me and the whole thing becomes about how I can love you. That's what church is about. It's not about worrying about if people on the other pew over there like you. It's about whether your soul is in such a state you're willing to serve them whether they like you or not. Doing for others for their sake, whether we get the credit or not. The better we love God, the more capable we become at loving ourselves and others. The more complacent we become, the more shallow we become. Self-focused and self-satisfying, no matter who it hurts. So with God's help, we need God. Always have, always will. With God's help, we can do these things. You know, the part that Jan read of Scripture today, we sometimes think of the, Beati- the, the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5 of Matthew with the Beatitudes. And sometimes we think that's where it ends. It goes on for two more chapters, like whole chapters. It is a very long sermon. They didn't have pews or lunch to get to. I mean, they were going to get bits of bread and fish. If you go back, and I encourage you, take your bulletin home, look at Matthew chapter 7, all of it. It will knock you off your socks. It talks about not judging the other. Mind the the plank in your eye instead of the, the sliver in someone else's. 
It talks about the narrow way to heaven, which is Jesus' way. It talks about how we're supposed to care for the other, how we're supposed to give ourselves to God's work in the world. It has nothing to do with all of this self-focused stuff. Don't listen to me and my sermon. While I appreciate that, go look at the words of Jesus. Go listen to his message for you today. Matthew chapter 7, read all of it. 29 verses. It's not, it's just pretty great. Uncle Screwtape says this in letter 10, all mortals tend to turn into the thing they are pretending to be. You are what you practice. You become, you're living, you're doing, becomes how you think, how you talk, what you put in, what you practice. So what are you practicing? What are you planting? What are you becoming? And as a church, what are we practicing? What are we planting? And what are we yet becoming? So I'm going to end with this. Anne Lamott says in her book, um, All New People, she gives us this practice. So I'll ask you these questions. Just think to yourself, what sound does a one-handed clap make? Not as satisfying, right? What sound does rain make? Japanese proverb says it doesn't make a sound until it hits something, an umbrella, a hat, a puddle. Think about it. What sound does grace make? Well, likewise, it doesn't make a sound until it hits something. A broken life, a broken relationship, a deeply embedded fear or insecurity. What sound does grace make? It doesn't until it hits one of us. And then it makes all the beautiful music we could ever possibly imagine. To intentionally plant grace means a harvest of grace to offer yourselves and others along the journey. Intentionally praise God on the mountaintops and when the mountains are in your way. God is still present in the dark and still loves even when we don't. But beauty can be found and shared in the journey when we pick him first, always and in all ways. Pray together. Gracious God, in the highlands and heartaches, we will praise you all the same because you are the same good God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You understand what it's like to have mountains before you. And you give us faith the size of a mustard seed, and you tell us to say, Move. And Lord God, move through this congregation today that each one of us can proudly say, boldly say, with the faith that we have in you, to our mountains, move. And when we get to the mountaintop, almighty God, let us praise you mountaintops. And may our words not be for us, may they be for you. Because everything you do and say is for us. Almighty God, let us praise you on the mountains. And when those mountains are in our way, you are God. Amen. Let us stand together for, as I give you a benediction and I send you forth out into this world to go move those mountains. The size of a mustard seed, friends, that's all the faith you need. 
Keep your focus on him. Don't turn to complacency. And if you find yourself slipping that way, say, no, move out of my way. I am, I am a beloved child of God. Nothing, not the darkness of this world, nothing is going to shake me away from my faith in God. You keep saying that and you will move mountains. You keep believing that and God will move them for you.